Okay, good deal. Hope everyone had a decent lunch. Uh, should have had plenty of time to uh, finish the uh, little exercise. So I'll work on getting those uh, graded and getting them out to you. Uh, I still have got one of the assignments graded. I still have uh, this one, the other one. So uh, I'll be working on getting those done. Uh, just uh, just as a reminder, tomorrow I have surgery, so we'll only have class during the morning, and then uh, I'll let you out at noon, or probably a little before noon, and then. Will be done until next week. So tomorrow, primarily, will focus on the immune system. I believe is what we're talking about: immune system and some immune system pathophysiology. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off. We had talked about respiratory alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, and uh, I believe we talked about uh, metabolic alkalosis all before lunch. So now we're going to spend uh, probably the rest of the day focusing our, our attention toward uh, metabolic acidosis. And metabolic acidosis is a, is a pretty tricky one. Really, all the metabolic disorders are really tricky. Um, but this one can be particularly tricky. There's a lot going on. Uh, so let's talk about metabolic acidosis. All right, so we determined that the primary problem, that, that the primary acid-base anomaly is, is a metabolic acidosis. What do we need to think? Well, a metabolic acidosis can fall into one of two categories, and, and those two categories are as follows. Something known as normal anion gap metabolic acidosis and elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, so those are the two major forms and we'll talk about how we can actually differentiate between them. And unfortunately, it does involve a little bit of math. <clears throat> so I have my normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. This is sometimes referred to as hyperchloremic. hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. All right, so that's one type. The other major type is what we call elevated anion gap. metabolic acidosis. All right, there we go. So these are the two major types. So this, whatever this anion gap business is, it must be kind of important, huh? At least in the context of metabolic acidosis, and in fact it is. So any time, and so this is something that we're gonna need to add on to ABG interpretation, any time that you determine your patient has a primary, their primary deficit is a metabolic acidosis. It doesn't matter if it is uncompensated, partially compensated or compensated. If a metabolic acidosis is present, you need to take some extra steps. You need to determine whether or not that is a, a normal anion gap or an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. And so the way that we do that is we have to calculate something known as the anion gap, right? So we need to figure out the anion gap. <clears throat> so remember earlier today, we talked about the concept of electroneutrality. Uh, could you just remind me what electroneutrality is? Uh, for every positive or negative charge, um, or is it positive and negative? Yeah, so you have to have a positive. For every anion in the body, you have to have a cation, right? So for every positive charge you have in your body, you have to have a negative charge, right? Um, so the positives and negatives cancel each other out in essence. So when we take all the positive charges in the body and add them up, 
and we take all the negative charges in the body and add them up, the negative charges, and I subtract the, the anions from the cations, what should I get? Zero. Should get zero, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think in the, in the real world that we can account for every single individual charge in the body? We can't. We just simply can't do that. What we can do is we can look at the major ones. All right. So the way that we figure out the anion gap is we look at the major cations. And what do you suppose the most prevalent cations are going to be in plasma? Remember, we're looking at blood, the arterial blood gas or at, at blood in general. Sodium is gonna be the primary cation. All right, what else? Potassium. Sodium and potassium, right? So sodium plus potassium. So these are the major cations, would you guys agree? All right, good. So what I'll do is I will find out what my sodium is and what my potassium is, and then I'll add them together. You may see a formula that looks like this. You ever seen a symbol that looks like that before? That's a sigma. What does sigma mean? Anyone take statistics or work with uh, spreadsheets and lots of numbers, you'll know that, right? Because that's a button you're hitting a lot when you're putting spreadsheets together that deal with numbers. So sigma means add them up. It just means add everything up. Take the sum up, right? So if you see this formula in books or on videos or written down in papers, this is something called sigma notation, it means add them up, right? So you take the sum, add up the sum of the sodium and the potassium, and then you subtract from that the sum of the major extracellular anions, and what do you suppose they are? Chloride, good. Chloride and what's the other major negatively charged, right? Anion. Chloride and bicarbonate, right? HCO3. So let's say that our patient has a sodium of 140, 140 milliequivalents per liter. They have a potassium of four milliequivalents per liter. All right. Uh, let's say they have a chloride of 110 milliequivalents per liter. Um, and a bicarbonate of 25 milli equivalents per liter. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sum of the sodium and the potassium because those are my cations, right? So these are the cations, the major cations, and that gives me 144. Are you guys good with that? And then I'm going to take the sum of the anions so what's 110 plus 40, uh, 25? 135. 135. And now I'm going to subtract the anions from the cations, right? So these are the cations here. And these are the anions. And what does that give me? Nine. And that gives me an anion gap of nine milli equivalents per liter. All right. Do you guys see how we calculate the anion gap? It's really easy, right? It's really easy. And the normal anion gap, the normal anion gap is approximately 12 milli equivalents per liter, all right, plus or minus four 
milli equivalents per liter. And so the number that I want you guys to focus in on today is 16 milli equivalents per liter. If the anion gap is greater than 16, that definitively suggests an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Are you guys okay with that? Greater, 16 or greater. Than yeah, the normal value is 12 plus or minus four. So in this particular situation, with an anion gap of nine, that's okay, right? Right, our patient has a normal anion gap. So if this particular patient had a metabolic acidosis, we would say that they have a normal anion gap or hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, not an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. You guys okay with that? Okay. All right. So here's the thing. Normally the anion gap is small, right? Normally the anion gap is small. And let's just talk about the different types of acidosis now, and then I'll re we'll return and we'll explain what's going on with the anion gap. <clears throat> um, well, let's just do it now. Maybe we'll just do it now and it'll make a little more, hopefully it'll make a little more sense. So with the anion gap, what <clears throat> can happen is let's say that I add, okay, into this <coughs> mix here. Let's say that I add into this mix some organic acid. All right. Let's say that I add a bunch of lactate, lactic acid rather. All right. So I put you into a shock state, you're in hypovolemic shock, you're making a lot of lactic acid. What is that lactic acid doing? as the cells are releasing it because they're in, a, in an anaerobic state. What, what's that lactic acid doing? It's dissociating into what? Blood. Yeah, it goes into the blood, and then what does it do? It dissociates into hydrogen ions and lactate. Anions, right? All right, so the lactic acid is dissociating into hydrogen ions and lactate. And what kind of charge does the lactate have on it? What charge does lactate have? Has a negative charge, right? It's the, it's the conjugate base. And then the hydrogen ions are the, the conjugate acids, right? Okay. So let me ask you a question. Can we actually, are we, so when we do the anion gap, when we calculate the anion gap, are we taking lactate ion buildup? Is that going into the equation? What do you think? No, it's not, right? So this is what some this is something known as an unmeasured anion. We don't measure it. And what those unmeasured anions the more of these that build up, the larger this difference between cations and anions will be. Okay? It's unmeasured. It's like a mystery meat. Does that, does that make sense? So what happens is, if I calculate the anion gap, and let's say that the anion gap is 24, okay? That means there is a very large difference between the cations and the anions, right? And there's some mystery meat that, meet, that needs to account for that difference, right? Something is adding a bunch of anions into the system, right? Does that make sense? Are you guys okay with that? If you're getting your values from CL... Yes. If you're getting your values from that, mm -hmm. how does it account into the negative number. So what, what's, what's happening in an anion gap metabolic acidosis <clears throat> is typically your, your chloride is gonna change and it's gonna get a little lower. Okay, so it goes into yeah. one of those 
And, and remember, your, your bicarbonate is going to be really low as well. So you're losing bicarbonate, right? So let's just do this. Let's say that I put, uh, let's say that we have somebody in lactic acidosis. And let's give them a bicarbonate of 10 now, all right? And we can keep everything the same, right? Right? So what's that going to do to the anion gap? Everything else is the same. So sodium is 140, potassium is 4. Okay. Negative 1? Negative 1. Or okay, so so it's, it's going to... This is going to be 34. Or, um, so this is still 144, right? Right, yeah. This is still 144. So mm -hmm. let me just put this in red here. 144. Uh, we'll just even keep the sodium, or the chloride. So, so 20 minus 144. So 144 subtract what? 15. One, 110 plus 10 is what? Don't make this hard. This doesn't need to be hard. 120, right? Yeah, Are you guys okay? The, the anions are 120. 110 plus 10, right? The only thing that's changed here is this, the, uh, I've just dropped the bicarb, right? You guys okay with that? And so that gives me 144 minus 120. What does that give me for the, an, uh, the anion gap? Say again? 24. 20, 24. So this was nine, and then this gives me 24. You guys go with that? Is that elevated or not? It's highly, elevated. highly elevated, right? <clears throat> so something has come in, knocked the, the, the bicarb out, right? Knocked the bicarbonate out, and it did so, and the, and the chloride did not change, right? So the chloride's still 110, and my bicarb got knocked out. So what is accounting for that big difference here? It's the presence of these anions that, that we don't directly measure. Does that make sense? So this acid came in and knocked out, you can kind of look at it as knocking out the bicarb, right? and a bunch of anions are now floating around, right, accounting for that loss of bicarb. But we can't directly measure them, except we can infer that they're there because of the anion gap getting large. Does that make sense? You guys, you guys okay with that? Now, with a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, what tends to happen is you tend to lose bicarbonate. Right, so you don't you don't tend to have um, these these mystery meats floating around, but with a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, and I'll do this, I'm going to lose my bicarb. So let's say we lose a bicarb, right? So the bicarb is 10, but what's going to happen is because I lose negative charges. Right, a negative charge is leaving, and ne another negative charge kind of shifts into, into the, the place of it, right? And that tends to be chloride, chloride shifts. Remember, we talked about the chloride shift a little earlier. So what we tend to see happen is the chloride will kind of go up. So let's say that, so my, my bicarb went down and my chloride went up to 122. Potassium remained the same and sodium remained the same. So that gives me 144 minus, what's 122 plus 10? 132. So what's 144 minus 132? 12, right? So this particular patient has an anion gap of 12 milliequivalents per liter, which is normal, right? There's, it's normal. The, the, the chloride shifted out because there was no unmeasured anion taking the place, right? So does that make sense where this gap comes from? You guys okay with that? Okay. Now that we understand a little bit about what the anion gap is and where it comes from,
Let's talk about the things that cause an elevated <coughs> anion gap metabolic acidosis. So, your patient has a metabolic acidosis, you calculate the anion gap and it is elevated, right? These are the things that I want you to think about, right? So an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis is the result of fixed acid, and this tends to be organic. These tend to be organic acids. These are fixed acids that accumulate. All right, and remember a fixed acid is something that you can't get rid of through the respiratory tract, right? It's, it's not like uh, CO2 or carbonic acid, it's not volatile. It's fixed, some, typically some sort of organic <laughs> acid. All right, when you see an elevated anion gap, I want you to think of mud piles. There are several other acronyms out there. This is kind of an old school one, but it's kind of the one that I go with, and so I'll throw it at you guys, okay? <clears throat> mud piles, this, this, these are the differentials that you wanna think about for an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis, all right? And so the M, and these are all things that are going to add unmeasured anions. So the M stands for methanol, and metformin. All right, you guys remember what methanol is, right? That came up a little bit in pharmacology. We talked about it's one of the toxic alcohols, right, methanol. And you guys remember what metformin is, right? What's metformin? Uh, diabetes. Right, glucophage, also known as glucophage, right? And remember how I talked about um, there is a, an adverse reaction to <laughs> contrast media? People that receive a CT with contrast, and if they are uh, if they if they uh, are taking metformin, that can precipitate a um, sudden onset severe metabolic acidosis, right? Um, so metformin, and in some cases, metformin can spontaneously cause that in some patients that take it as well. All right, so that's the M. The U is uremia. What does uremia stand for? Uremia. Huh? No. no. Blood in the urine would be hematuria. Or it would be hemoglobin. No, uremia. Ure means what? Urine, emia means? How about with urea in the blood? There you go, urine in the, essentially urine in the blood, right? That makes sense, uremia. What causes uremia? What's, what's the thing that you wanna think about with uremia? Renal failure, good, renal failure, right? Renal failure patients become uremic, yeah. Okay, uh, the D, is diabetic ketoacidosis. The keto acids that are produced, not the acetone, because that's actually not an acid, that's a, that's a ketone, but the acids that are produced from fat breakdown, right? They produce lots of anions, unmeasured anions, so DKA, all right? P. And this is fairly rare now, so this is not something that you guys are probably ever gonna run into anymore, and this is an old, old substance called peraldehyde. You rarely see it used anymore. I'll throw it in just for the sake of completion. I, what did you call it? Peraldehyde. Peraldehyde? Yeah. I'm surprised, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised you've never heard of it because it's, it's a pretty rare thing to run into anymore. I stands for INH and iron. Specifically, um, iron toxicity. So does anyone know what INH is? Or isoniazide? INH is, a, is an old medication 
that is uh, commonly used to treat tuberculosis. It's kind of like a frontline anti-tubercular med. And then iron is just that, iron. Right? So INH and iron toxicity <laughs> tends to cause this. L stands for lactic acidosis. E stands for ethylene glycol. Again, that's another one of those toxic alcohols. And then S stands for salicylate. So salicylate toxicity, so aspirin, um, oil of wintergreen, mentholatum, bismuth, uh, salicylate, like cup of bismol, those kinds of things, all the salicylates. So these are the common differentials that cause an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that's a good thing for us. If somebody has an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis, there are there is a fairly concise list of things that it's likely to be. So then you go, okay, well, is there a history of methanol ingestion? Not really. Is a patient taking metformin? No. Or kidneys, his kidneys are working, so it's not uremia. Uh, blood sugar is normal. There are no ketones in the blood. Um, so it's not DKA, paraldehyde. Well, didn't run into that. He's, he, he, he's not on INH or iron. Um, but he's, uh, he's hypotensive and he's septic. Um, well, let's go ahead and run a, a lactate, right? Check the lactate level. Oh, the lactate level's elevated. Oh, okay. Um, it's really elevated. Okay, that, that suggests that lactic acidosis is the cause. Does that, does that kind of make sense how you can work through these differentials? Right. So many of these differentials you can test for or history and physical exam will point you toward uh, one or more of these potentially. Okay, so that's an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis, right? Are you guys, you guys okay there with that? All right. So again, if somebody has a metabolic acidosis, we need to calculate their anion gap and determine whether or not it's elevated. Okay, so then let's move on and talk about the normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. And this is often, not always, but often it is due to a loss of bicarbonate. So I lose bicarbonate from the body. So it's not necessarily due to the buildup of some, some acid, some organic acid that is dumping unmeasured anions in the body, but rather it's due to some process that causes us to lose bicarbonate, right? And if you had to guess, what are the, what are like the two major ways we can lose bicarbonate? Diarrhea. You can lose it out of the gastrointestinal tract, or you can lose it out of the, the urine, right? So GI and kidney are the common areas that we look at when somebody has a normal anion gap or this so-called hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. All right, so first and foremost, we wanna talk about gastrointestinal loss or GI losses, all right? As you guys, someone had mentioned, diarrhea is a common cause for this, right, if you have diarrhea because you lose a lot of base. Why? Why do you lose, why, why is uh, having diarrhea, why would you lose so much base, so much bicarbonate, if you're having lots of diarrhea? What's going on there? Why though? Why are we? Why do we tend to lose base out of the? Let me ask you a question. 
when the chyme, and chyme is, is the food mixed with stomach acid essentially, right? When that leaves your stomach, is a pH high or low? It's high when it leaves right, your stomach? It's low. it's low, right? Because it's a bunch of hydrochloric acid. Now your stomach has a really thick mucus lining, right? To protect itself from the acid. But what about your intestines? When that gets dumped out into the intestine, right? There you go, right? So right, right as right chime gets dumped out of the stomach into your small intestine, and what's the very first part of the small intestine known as? Is it du du duodenum? Remember that eugenium is in the middle, right? Eugenium. The J is in the middle. And I remember the ili ileum is at the end because the ileum connects into the large intestine, right? And I just remember the ileal cecal junction is where the appendix is. So it has to be the has to be the duodenum, right? I thought it was right. I, yeah. You were <laughs> right. So confused. You just in it, yeah, you're in it. Yeah, I was like, wait. you're ignorantly right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a one third, right? Well, there are three choices. Uh, yeah, so it is a duodenum. So what happens is right there where the the stomach goes in the duodenum, there's a little duct, right? And there's a little duct that actually connects the pancreas. And one of the major roles of the pancreas is to produce bicarbonate. It's like its major role produces large amounts of bicarbonate, and that bicarbonate gets dumped into the duodenum as that chyme is entering, and um, what does that bicarbonate do? It neutralizes that acidic pH and actually makes it more alkaline so you don't burn holes in your intestines. Does that, does that kind of make sense there? So that's why if you start having lots of diarrhea, lots of stools passing through your body, lots of bicarbonate is getting dumped into that diarrhea. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. This also is, uh, so another, uh, not common, but another cause for GI loss is something known as a fistula, particularly fistulas that involve the pancreas. And does, what is a fistula? It's an abnormal growth, right? Not a growth, it's an abnormal passage. So it's a, it's a passage that abnormally develops between two areas of the body, right? So if you get like a little abscess or something like that, that abscess can turn into um, a, a fistula. Like, a, like a, sometimes people can develop a fistula between their, um, their esophagus and their trachea, right? And then stuff from their trachea can get into their, or from their esophagus can get into their trachea because there's that little hole little erosion that is developed, as a, that's what we call fistula. Well, you can get fistulas in your gastrointestinal tract as well. And particularly if I get a fistula from the pancreas to some part of your GI tract, and then you just have this constant flow of bicarbonate coming out of the pancreas. Does that, does that kind of make sense there? Okay, so those are the common GI losses, all right? Uh, the second way is through the kidneys. And this commonly occurs in the tubules, renal tubular loss. Now we are going to dive into renal physiology later on, but I have to talk a little bit about it today for us to understand this. But for now, what I want you to remember is a disorder. It's actually a group of disorders known as renal tubular acidosis. Renal tubular acidosis, sometimes referred to as RTA, renal tubular acidosis. That's going to be one of the most common causes of bicarbonate loss. It's renal tubular, via renal mechanisms. And then the third one is, 
maybe not strictly a loss of bicarbonate, uh, but it is due to ingestion. So if I ingest, ingest uh, substances that can lead to a loss of bicarbonate, probably the most common one is something known as hyperalimentation. Let me write that out for you guys. Hyperalimentation. Um, does anyone know what that word means? Hyperalimentation? Never heard of that word before. So, alimentation refers to the alimentary canal, and the alimentary canal is just another term for the gastrointestinal tract. So, it, it kind of literally means hyper GI tract, um, but what it means in a clinical sense is if we overfeed patients. And this typically occurs in patients that are either being tube fed, so if they're re receiving tube feeding, or something called TPN. Does anyone know what TPN is or anyone ever heard of TPN? Close. TPN stands for total perineural nutrition. So that means somebody is getting all of their calories, all their nutrients intravenously, right? So this is someone who is unable to eat for whatever reason, their, maybe their GI tract isn't working, they've had surgery, or they're, they're, you know, they're intubated, they can't swallow, whatever the case, they are receiving their nutrition via IV, right? And so what can happen is, if they are getting fed through a, a feeding tube, a gastric tube, Right, either oral gastric, nasal gastric, or sometimes uh, a, a um, percutaneously placed tube, like a PEG tube or something like that, and they are getting too much of that feeding formula for their body's metabolism to deal with, um, that will cause a loss of bicarbonate. Right? And guess what? Lots of patients that you're gonna run into in the ICU are gonna be on either tube feeding or total parenteral nutrition. So it's, it's common and it's something that can happen. Um, and then I'll just give an example of something that's really good at, at uh, taking up uh, uh, bicarbonate ions. It'd be something like ammonium chloride. Okay. So this is the big picture of metabolic acidosis. I just, again, you, you do an uh, arterial blood gas, your patient has a primary metabolic acidosis, and then what you need to do is you need to calculate their anion gap and find out whether they have a, a normal anion gap or an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. If the anion gap is elevated, these are your major differentials, right? These are the common problems that are gonna cause that. These are things that cause an increase in unmeasured anions. If their anion gap is normal, however, and they have a normal or hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, you wanna think of things that cause a loss of bicarbonate. You can lose it through the GI tract, diarrhea and fistulas, renal tubular acidosis, and via ingestion that tends to be due to hyperalimentation such as too, uh, too much tube feeding or uh, overly aggressive total parenteral nutrition or TPN. Okay, so that's the big picture of um, anion gap or of metabolic acidosis. What, what I want to do now is I kind of want to shift and I want to focus in on renal tubular acidosis because I said that it was kind of a, um, it was kind of a uh, group of disorders, if you will. And so what we'll do is we'll spend some time talking about that. Let's see, it's not been quite an hour, but it's what, about 45 minutes? So I think I'll put you guys on a little break and then we'll pick it back up after a little break. So just take a little five, 10 minute break and come on back and we'll pick it back up.